Good morning. Welcome to the Well House of Worship, where people can feel free to be transformed, challenged, and developed into the person God has called them to be. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you're doing well. As you're getting online, make sure that you share and like this video. If you'd like to know more about our ministry, text The Well to 66866. You can also email us at info at thewellhow.com with any questions you may have. To worship through giving, text The Well How to 1-888-364-4483 or go to our website, thewellhow.com. We also use Cash App, dollar sign The Well How. We thank you in advance. Put some time in your schedule on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our deeper Bible studies. We would love to see you there. All right, up next is Praise and Worship, followed by Pastor Rob. Enjoy. Come on and bless the name of the Lord on today because he's worthy to be praised. Oh God, we praise your name. Never. 
I'm so happy and excited that you have joined in with us on today. And if you have not already done so, I'm, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and hit the share button and the like button because we endeavor to share this word. We want to get this word out to each and every person that we are connected with on this morning. It is Sunday morning and we know that Sundays are for worship. We don't only worship. We don't only lift up the name of the Lord on Sundays. We do it every every day of the week, but Sundays are the time that you and I come together in worship as a corporate body. And so we're so thankful that you are here. And, and, and again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it's offering time, so go ahead and begin to prepare your offering right now. I'm coming from the, the normal scripture that we've been reading from from the last couple of weeks. We have not moved away. Um, we're coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, and it says, Whoever sows sparingly, y'all know it, will also reap what? Sparingly. And whoever um, sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. 
and God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. There is something about this scripture that is so encouraging on today and each and every week that if we will just give from a place that is cheerful and where we just have um, a desire to give that God said he will give us enough. He will supply every one of our needs. And so we are thankful this morning for each and every one of you and, and, and you're deciding to give on today to support uh, the ministry. Yes, but ultimately you are given to our king. And so we're thankful because as we give unto him, he always gives back so much more in return. And, and so we're thankful. And at this time, as you see the information at the bottom of, this, of your screen, you can give online, you can give via text to give, and you can also give via cash out. So you have three opportunities or three options. And so there's no excuses. And so we thank you in advance. And so as we are going into prayer this morning, I want you just to hold up your phone or your, your mobile device, however you are giving on today, I want you to begin to hold it up right now as I pray over this offering and over our time together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, we just thank you for every sower on this morning, God. We know, oh God, that times are difficult and even in our giving, God, you're challenging our faith, but we thank you that we believe you enough and we trust you enough to give, oh God, to give of our treasure right now. And so God, I'm thankful for every sower on this morning. I'm praying that you will pour back into them, oh God, far more than what they have sowed on, to, on this morning, God, that you will give them back a hundredfold right now. I'm even praying for those that don't have to give, but have a desire. I'm praying for increase in their home, increase in their lives right now in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we love you because you said that you love a cheerful giver and we are doing just that. We are giving from a place of, of a desire, a, a want to give back to you for all the things that you have given unto us. And so we thank you. And even now as we uh, switch gears and get ready and prepare to go into the word on this morning, I'm praying that your presence will set upon the house on this morning. Wherever we are tuned in this morning, I'm praying that you will meet us at our very stations in our lives right now. God, I'm praying that the word and the, the anointing will flow from this place and it will be a transference, oh God, through, oh God, the monitor on this morning, oh God, across the airwaves right now. Let your anointing that destroys yokes and set captives free, let it flow right now in the name of Jesus Christ that, oh God, somebody this, this morning, oh God, hands will be released to lift them up to you, God, that somebody's mouth will be unlocked, oh God, to, oh God, send up a praise unto you, that somebody's heart, oh God, may be open to receive your spirit on today. I'm praying right now, God, that you would have your way. Oh God, your servants are desperate for you, God. Your servants are desperate and hungry for a word that will satisfy our appetite, that will hold us over, God. Give us a word that we can digest, God, that we can then, oh God, oh God, eat on and sup on tomorrow leftovers and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, God, that you will continue, God, to let your word marinate in us, God, that we'll be transformed and changed in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let everybody say amen, amen, oh man, oh man, amen, amen. All right, so we are continuing our series um, the anatomy of a worshiper. And today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 22, uh, verses 1 and 2. Then we're going to skip down to verses 17 and 18. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll drop down to verses 17 and 18. And I'm reading this from the King James Version. The King James Version. I'm reading this from the King James Version. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Uh-oh. It says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. 
And he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of that in blessing. And I'm skipping down to verse 17, that in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand, which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. I want to read verse number uh, verse number one again. It says, and it came to pass after these things. That God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And so for the next couple moments, I want to speak to you from the subject. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. We're continuing this awesome series Um the anatomy of a worshiper. When we're talking about the anatomy of a worshiper, which has us submarining beyond the surface to analyze the inner workings of a true worshiper. We're going beyond the aesthetics, the outside, the external, and we're going beneath the surface to, uh, to take note of what is the makeup, what's the inner workings of a true worshiper because some of us or so many of us rather have gotten caught up in what it appears to be and the sort of feeling and emotions one would have that would bring one to worship and therefore I am here to bring down some of those old ideologies and remind you that worship is so much more than what happens on Sunday morning or what happens when your favorite gospel artist sings that song that tugs at your heartstrings. Worship is so much bigger than that because worship is a lifestyle. Somebody say that with me. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle. I'm going to say it again. Worship is a lifestyle. Notice I said it is a what? A lifestyle. But I said it is a lifestyle, which indicates it is one of many different lifestyles. You have the minimalist lifestyle. You have the sustainable lifestyle, the digital lifestyle, the hipster lifestyle, the active lifestyle, the healthy lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are many different types of lifestyles in which every individual has chosen to live. And, and I say chosen because a lifestyle is a way of, of life accepted and endorsed by a group of people or an individual. This includes patterns of, of behavior, interaction, consumption, work, activity, and interests that characterizes how a person spends their time. Uh, I think um, they used to say, they're, they're, I've heard the saying that you can tell what's important to someone by looking at their checkbook. In other words, you can you can tell what's important to someone by where they spend their money. You can tell what's important to, to, to folks uh, by, the, by how they spend their time. You can tell um, uh, 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 what's important to someone by the way that, that they live. And so when we say worship is a lifestyle, then what we are really saying is the totality of the individual life based on the patterns of behavior, their interactions with uh, their interaction, their interactions, what they consume, the effort they they put forth in their interests are all representative of a life of one who has placed a high value on their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what a the lifestyle of a worshiper looks like. 
Um, uh, when we say worship is a lifestyle, that means that their interactions, how they treat people and and what they consume, the music, the watch they, what they what they watch on TV, their, the, the, the things that entertain them, how they treat their enemies, even and, and, and the activities that are going on in their lives. You take the totality of all of that, then that should give you some indication when you are a worshiper that gives you an indication of uh, the importance of God in their life. That's what a lifestyle of worship means. And when you break down worship entomologically, you have the root word, which is worth, W-O-R-T-H, word. And, and that word worth means it's a significant or or high value, appreciated, highly thought of. Uh, that's what worth means. It means that uh, that something is significant to me. It it has a high value. I place a high value on it. I there is a an appreciation for it, and I I think very highly of it. And, and so that's what worth is. But then you have the suffix ship. Uh, tagged along with it, which denotes a quality or status, office or or honor. And so what you have to understand is worship. Hear me now is an acknowledgement of the valuation I have placed on my relationship with Christ. Uh, worship is the the is me showing God how much he means to me or how much I value his presence in my life. We we like to quote the scripture that says for in him we lose we live, we move and we have our being. But I got to ask you this morning brothers and sisters does your life say the same? We're talking about worship is a lifestyle. Does your life say the same? Does it illustrate the fact that I am completely and utterly dependent upon God because I am nothing without him, that I will fail without him, that I am a man most miserable without him? Or does my lifestyle reveal that I have accepted and endorsed an egocentric, self-indulgent way of life? And so uh, the scripture has become nothing more than wordplay, but isn't it, but isn't anything I actually practice. In other words, I haven't placed a high enough value on my relationship with Christ that would motivate me to live in a way that will indicate to the world that Jesus is Lord over my life and he is my priority. And so when we talk about the anatomy of a worshiper, we are exploring those areas no one sees. No, no. Uh, we're going beyond the veil. It's, it's in the hidden place far from public view because the, the, the applause or the attention cannot stimulate or yeah, cannot stimulate worship. But worship flows from a place that has been touched by God and as a response of appreciation for what he has done and who he is, worship bursts forth and, and that's why the psalmist said, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me. In other words, what shall I distribute or give to the Lord? What shall I allocate or assign or relinquish to the Lord for all he has done for me? This where this is where a uh, uh, spontaneous worship is initiated because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, "Hallelujah!" I thank God for saving me. I thank God for healing me. I thank God for delivering me. I thank God for providing and for and for protecting me. Somebody right now ought to shout, what shall I give? What shall I give? What shall I give? What shall I give? We're talking about the anatomy 
of a worshiper. Last week, we stumbled upon the man Abraham, who God called from an imperfect place to a perfecting process. I'm going to say that again. God saw the heart of the man. Hear me now. But he also saw the man was incomplete and the environment in which he lived in was contributing to the flaws in his life. Also, God saw the influencers, his father and his family around him that were a detriment to his destiny. And so this shows us you can have a good heart, but be in the wrong place at the wrong time and completely miss out on your destiny. You can be anointed and wonderfully gifted, but have the wrong people pouring into you, rerouting you from the place that God is bringing you. And, and that's why you have to be so careful who you have aligned yourself with because they used to say birds of a feather uh -huh, flock together. And so if you have attached yourself to people who are going down, then the, the likelihood is, is that you are going down too. And so God called him and he's calling us. Let me slow down here. God's called him and he's calling us from our places of comfort in those people who uh, we have learned to rely upon to a place he will not reveal to us just yet because the journey if I noticed I said if we choose to accept it is the process of making us completely free from defects or as close to such a condition as possible. That's why James writes, count it all joy when you enter into diverse temptations. Uh, how many know this walk is filled with temptations and troubles uh, that will prove your intentions with God? These last 19 months has proven my relationship with Christ has nothing to do with a building. It has nothing to do with an affiliation. It has nothing to do with a person, but has everything to do with real intimacy between me and him. So James said, count it all joy when you enter into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire. Hear me now, wanting nothing. Another version says, lacking nothing. When I've gone through the test and the trial, when God brings me through them and when I hang in there, then God's going to perfect me so that I'm not lacking nothing. And so we see God beginning to make something out of nothing in Abraham. But as we have seen in our own lives and here in Abraham's, just because he's making you something from nothing does not mean that you have a Immunity from challenges. We see this when Abraham begins to follow God along with Sarah and his nephew Lot. They have they have left Haran, but on their journey, a severe famine uh, strikes the land, and that's where many of us get tripped up at. We we left the place where we uh, feel most comfortable. We left the place where we have security. We have stability. We are no longer a associated with or connected to the people we always depended on. And now when a pandemic hits, we are in an unfamiliar territory and we begin to second guess ourselves because if God was in this, surely he would not allow us to struggle the way that we are. Am I talking to anybody this morning? I, I can only speak to, uh, for myself at the beginning of 2021. God said it's time to launch the whale, but God, uh, but I'm saying, I'm thinking, but God, we're in the midst of a whole entire uh, global pandemic. There's no seed money. There's no guarantee anybody will follow. We don't have a building and I can continue to make excuse after excuse after excuse. But God said, I ain't trying to hear none of that. It's time. Go and plant. And so we're out here. And so many of you have been consistent and committed to the well. And I count and I count it a privilege to be your pastor. And the thing that we're missing is a place for us to 
gather in for in-person worship. We had a space uh, uh, and it was a really nice space and it was a place that we could serve you the way God has, has envisioned and, and, and you, would, you would have been proud uh, to invite your family and friends to. But just when we were about to sign uh, the agreement, the Delta variant struck and they shut the building down again. And so like we do when so, so something unexpected happens that does not align with our expectation doubt begins to creep in anytime something unscheduled happens we begin to scramble and, and our instincts kick in regardless of your modus operandi when things happen spontaneously we revert back to our innate pattern of behavior for responding to stimuli but I'm here to tell you that you cannot trust in your instincts because your instincts and your emotions are influenced by your, by your flesh and the body Bible says some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and we stand upright. It said that they, it says uh, some trust in chariots and some in horses. In other words, some people trust in their instinct and they trust in their flesh and they trust in their intellect. But then there's another group of us believers who trust in the name of the Lord. We ain't got time for my network of people because my back is up against the wall. All I have to do is call on the name of Jesus. But it says, but, but they, he says that they are brought down and fallen. Those who, who, who count on and depend on the flesh. Those who look everywhere else but God. It says that they are brought down and fallen. But the folks that call upon the name of the Lord. But it says that, but we are risen. We stand up right. In other words, when we depend upon and when we call on the name of the Lord in the midst of this pandemic, he shall raise us up and cause us to overcome every challenge because we are overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Does anybody have a testimony this morning that God has, that God has continued providing for you that when you could not see your way through, God literally made a way. Somebody say, I have a testimony. 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 So we know Abraham and Sarah went into Egypt and didn't exactly uh, present the truth. No, no. Uh, because they remain a work in progress. Yet God allows them to leave with far more than they entered with, which made him a, a very wealthy man. But in Genesis 15, Abraham says, Oh Lord, what good are your blessings when I don't have a son? Since you've given me no children, my servant Eleazar will inherit my word. In other words, you have been good to me, God. You have blessed me beyond measure. But the one thing that I really want, the one thing that I truly desire, the one thing that you have promised me, you have not provided unto me. And it wasn't until chapter 21 that we find that God was gracious to Sarah and she became pregnant and bore Abraham a son. And today we come to chapter 22 and it says, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. I'm going to say that again. It says that and it came to pass that God did tempt Abraham. You got to understand that that word tempt means to test. I want y'all to uh, perk up your ears real good here. It says that God did tempt Abraham. Uh, that word tempt means to test or to reveal what a person is really made of. And it usually involves difficulty and hardship. Uh, we saw this same sort of testing with uh, the three Hebrew boys and the threat of being tossed into uh, the fiery furnace if they refuse to worship Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. I sometimes get frustrated because God is omnipotent, which means he has all power. God is omniscient, which means he knows everything, right? Uh, God is omnipresent, which means he's 
everywhere. Uh, yet he, yet we, yet he, he knows exactly what we are about to go through, and he knows, and he has the authority and the power uh, to stop it in its tracks. And we have brought it upon ourselves. We sometimes we have brought situations upon ourselves, but God has the ability. To stop it, if it happened, that means he allowed it to happen. And so what I'm struggle sometimes with is that God will allow different things to happen. But what we're learning here is, is that he has the authority. He not only has the authority to keep it from us, he has, he has allowed the test because the purpose of the test is to discover what is in our hearts, whether we will keep his commandments or not. I, I need you to understand this morning is that that test that you're going through right now is not meant to destroy you, but it's meant to prove what's really in your heart. He wants to know if you are going to serve him, even though for the past 19 months and, and, and who knows how much longer you have been living through a pandemic and the fears and anxieties are overwhelming. He wants to know, can can you serve me when it's not convenient and the routine has been tossed out the window? He wants to know what is your motivation and am I your priority? The test is also is meant to humble you, uh, to benefit you in the end. I, I don't know about you, but the way my life is set up these days, my insufficiencies and inadequacies are different deafening in my mind. All I think about is what I need to do but am incapable of in and of myself to do them. And so oftentimes when you are put through the test, you begin to experience what Lady Tamika calls shrinkage. Mm -hmm. That didn't make sense, but let me explain because it didn't make sense to me either until she explained what shrinkage is. Uh, women with natural hair know what I'm talking about because natural hair shrinkage happens when curls go from lengthy to stretched out to a tight compacted coil. As, as healthy natural hair dries or loses moisture, each strand contracts, which is an indicator your hair is properly moisturized and has good elasticity. Uh, notice I said it's the healthy hair uh, that contracts. It, it, it's, the, it's the natural, it's the natural healthy hair that, that when it dries, it, it, the, it coils up, it shrinks. I, 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 again, I didn't understand that when she first was talking about shrinkage as it relates to hair but as we're talking and as God begins to reveal to me is that it's the same thing that happens to us when we are in the midst of a test. Uh, you go in, you go into a test with a very big ego. Come on somebody. We go in thinking very highly of ourselves but as God proves us through the test as we stay locked in position and continue to hold on to God's hand in the midst of the test. And as we submit ourselves to his will, then our egos begin to shrink and you see God from a healthy perspective and your dependence upon God begins to increase. Understand when you are in the midst of a test and you are going through trials and tribulations, uh, then, 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 then God will figure out a way to humble you, to shrink you down to size so he can get you in a place where he can where he can use you greatly where he can where he can begin to manifest himself in you while you are egocentric and while you are so much uh, more uh, uh, seeking to indulge yourself he can't use you the way that he desires to use you I was telling somebody uh, on yesterday morning uh, that, that, that you may be in the very place where God wants you but until you fully give yourself over 
different to God, then he can't use you the way that he wants to use your brothers and your sisters and your parents, those that you've been sent to save or the, the, the curse that you've been uh, chosen to break. You can't have the power and you can't, uh, you can't leverage the anointing until you fully give over yourself. That's why Job was able to say, behold, I go forward, but he is not there and backward. Come on, somebody. But I cannot perceive him on the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hides himself on the right hand that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take that when he have tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Sometimes in the midst of our crises, uh, we sought the Lord and we cannot find him. Uh huh. Is anybody there this morning? Sometimes in the midst of our crises, we cried out to the Lord and we cannot hear him. No matter how far we look or in which direction, we cannot find him because he seems to be just beyond the veil that we can't seem to penetrate. But even though I can't seem to get to him, I know that I know he is still in control of my situation. And as I remain locked in position and as I submit to him and say, here I am, then he's going to work it out for my good. Somebody say it's working for my good. 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 It's working. It's working for my good. And so it's interesting. Let me slow down a little bit. We almost there. And so it's interesting that we know trouble is coming. Yeah. We know that there's uh, there, there's some hard times that's just in front of Abraham. He, he don't know because it just says that God approaches him and says that he tempts Abraham. But all Abraham sees or all Abraham says is here I am. And God says to Abraham, he says, take now thy son. Not just your son, but your only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. This is crazy because God says, take your only son, Isaac. Uh, first, does, that, does God not know that Abraham has a whole nother son, Ishmael? Uh, yeah, of course he knows. He, he knows it, but he does not recognize him or, do, or he does acknowledge his, he does not acknowledge his existence or validity because Ishmael is the son of flesh, of the flesh, while Isaac is the son of promise. Ishmael is the results of the plan Sarah and, uh, and Abraham devised to assist God, uh, but Isaac is the fulfillment of what God promised. Uh -huh. It is through Isaac that all of the nations of the earth will be blessed, not Ishmael. Yet God is telling Abraham to offer his only son a promise for a burnt offering. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Uh, he, he, he knows my God. Come on somebody. He, he knows Knows that the promise come uh, follow me here. He knows the promise is going to flow through through Isaac. Uh, God knows it, and so does uh, so does Abraham. Abraham knows that God has already spoken and said that it's through Isaac that I'm going to bless your seed. It, it's through Isaac that all the entire world is going to be blessed. I'm going to bless you to be a blessing, but it's going to come through. Isaac. And yet now here God says uh, you need to take Isaac and go to the mountain and sacrifice him to me. You need to go do that. You need to you need to go to, to, to go to go uh, uh, offer him as a burnt offering. Understand that a burnt offering involved cutting up and burning the whole animal on the altar. It expresses at least two ideas that the offerer, hear me now, is giving himself entirely to God for the animal represents the offerer and that the animal's death uh, atones for the worshiper's sin. I'm going to say that again. The animal is the representative
representative of the worshiper. Mm -hmm. And through his and through this offering, the worshiper is giving their entire selves to God. And it's through committed service that the worshiper acknowledges the worth of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Here, the, uh, the, here in the request of for, for Abraham to sacrifice his only son, we see an illustration of worship. Mm -hmm. He first says, here I am. When he hears the voice of God, he, he didn't hide himself like, like Adam and Eve. He says, here am I. He, he doesn't ignore it, but he responds and says, here I am. I am. Uh, basically, he is saying, I am present and awaiting your instructions. Do I have anybody, worshipers in the house on today that is sitting, waiting on instructions from God? He is saying, I am not only in position, uh -huh, but I am also available to respond to your instructions. So lay it on me. Mm -hmm. He, he says, not only, mm -hmm, he says, not only am I in a place that, uh, that, 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 uh, that you need me to be, but, uh, but, uh, but I am also willing and able to do what you are instructing me to do. My God, it's not only that I am, it's one thing to be in place. Uh -huh. It's one thing to be in position, but it's an entire another thing to be a Swiss Army Knight, to be able to be used or, or obtained at God's discretion. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for a people who will surrender themselves for the service of the king. And so my question to you this morning is what will you render unto the Lord? How are you going to serve the Lord? Come on somebody. How are you going to, what do you have to present to God this morning? Here we have Abraham has has been asked to give back his son to, to God. He, he's been asked to offer his son. He's been asked to cut his son up and, uh, and, 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 and consume him with fire. Understand Isaac is between the ages of 20 and 27 and so he has spent all of this time, Abraham has spent all of this time with Isaac and has made plans and has dreams of the possibilities that's going to come into effect because of Isaac and they have fished together and they have hunted together and Abraham had, had poured himself into Isaac because Isaac was the heir apparent and so sacrificing Isaac him now is like sacrificing himself how many parents do I have out there that if your, if your child's life was on the line you would say take me and save him I, I and so what we have here is Abraham is, is like is, as, as he's given Isaac or as he's preparing to give Isaac, what he's really doing is he's preparing to give of himself. And the Bible says it's a three days journey from Beersheba to Mount Moriah where he would offer his son. Can you imagine for 72 hours all Abraham is contemplating is, is, is what he has to give of all Abraham is thinking about is everything that he's about to lose because the blessing is connected to Isaac. He 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 knows Ishmael is somewhere over there, somewhere out there, somewhere. But the blessing, the promise uh, that that God has made to him is connected uh, to Isaac. All he can think about is what he's about to give up. Uh, do I have anybody in this place that can understand where Abraham must? be right now. Thinking about all that, that God has called you to and all that God is commanding you to give up. My God, there are friends and family members in places that I used to go that I just can't go anymore. And so for three days I'm thinking about how, why, uh, how in, in the world am I going to give it up? How am I going to let it go? God is not asking. He's not asking him to, notice here, he's not asking Abraham to to kill his son immediately but rather requires him to think about what must be done for three long days and once they arrive to the base of the mountain he leaves his servants and the donkeys behind because the mountain is so steep that uh, the donkeys cannot climb and so 
This shows us that the place where God wants him to make this offering, where God, the place that God wants us to be in order for him to get there, he, he not only has to accept the mental challenge, uh, but he also has to make the physical commitment to carry out God's will. I can't think about it. I can't just think about it only, but I actually got to walk it out. I can't just talk the talk, but I got to walk the walk. I got to do what God has called me to do during those three days. He had every opportunity uh -huh, uh, to turn around and, and no one would have uh, no one would have blamed him for not being willing to offer his son as a burnt offering. And, and from the base of the mountain until he reached the peak, he, he could have said, I'm not physically able to do what God has required because remember he's he's between 120 and 127 years old but he has or he was committed to doing what God has requested of him can I talk to somebody this morning uh, God is requiring from each one of us uh, to, uh, a commitment to offer our lives to him for for many of us we've allowed three days we've allowed three weeks we've allowed three years to elapse and we have considered everything we are going to have to give up. They are things and people that we love deeply and how difficult it is to let go of something that you are so attached to. How difficult it is to give up something that has become a piece of your identity. How challenging is it to let go of something you have found pleasure in for all of your life. How difficult is it to give up someone that you deeply love but I'm here to tell you that you have you have to give you have to give it to God no matter how big or, or the amount or how much it hurts he, he is going to give you so much more in return because we used to say in the old church you can never beat God's giving no matter how hard you try and so we get to verse 17 and because Abraham who was willing to risk it all and because Abraham was willing to offer his son, his only son, God said that in blessing, I will bless you and, and in multiplying, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the sea and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. This infers to me uh, that, that had not Abraham been willing to uh, make this offering without him being willing to give up himself, then he couldn't have, then he could have returned home with, 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 with nothing to show for his journey. He could have had this 50 year uh, relationship with God and wouldn't have had anything to show for it. How many of you, how long have you been following God and what do you have to show for it? How long have you been going to church week after weekend, but you don't have nothing to show for it? How long have you been calling yourself a believer, but have nothing to show for it? I'm here to tell you when you when, 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 when you look at the anatomy of a worshiper, they are people who don't mind giving of themselves. They don't only give of their treasure, but they give of their time and their talents. They they they, they give they, they give even when it hurts. They give even when they don't understand. And let's be clear, I'm not talking about money here, but we we but as we give of ourselves away to God and we draw closer to Him, then He begins to convict us in areas of our lives where we didn't know was problematic. But out of my love and admiration for Him, I freely offer those areas too. And that's how we begin to see real change in our lives, and we see the medical blessings begin to flow. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Offering yourself to God is the least that you can do for everything that he's done for you. And you offer your body by neither yielding your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield your, yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but under 
grace, but, 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 but when you offer yourself to God, then the grace of God will pour out over you and the blessings of God will flow over you. That's why God said, I will really bless you and I will really multiply your seed. Somebody say, here I am. Here I am. I'm here to present myself to God. I'm here to give over everything to God because it's in him that I live, move, and have my being. I'm here uh, to, to give service to God. I'm here to, to give myself. I'm here to say, yes, I, I withhold nothing. I, I withhold nothing because I understand that when I give myself over to God, in due time, he will exalt me. That's why I say, here I am. Here here I stand. Lord, my life is in your hands. Lord, I'm longing to see your desires revealed in me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me, so you can get the glory out of my life. So take my heart, take my life as a living sacrifice. All of my dreams and all of my plans. Lord, I place this in your hands. I give myself away. I freely give myself away that you can get the glory. You know better for me, God, than I know for myself. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. So here I am to worship. Somebody say, here I am. Here I am to worship my God. Here I am to bow down. I submit. Yes, God. Here I am to submit my will to yours. Not my will, God. But let your will be done in my end. Here I am. 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 Here I am to worship. Here I am. As a as we look at the anatomy of a worshiper, my God, as we look at the anatomy of a worshiper, we look at the substratum of, of what makes a worshiper. Last week we talked about, uh, really it was part one to this, um, we, we talked about obedience is better. We talked about obedience is better. And we, we understood that from last week, that obedience is better than sacrifice. But at some point, in order for you to be obedient, you are going to have to sacrifice. You are going to have to be willing to give, to offer your body, to offer your mind, to offer the job, to, to, to give the child away to God, to surrender Ha! Huh. Yes, God, to surrender what the marriage, to, to surrender the finances, not my will, but your will be done, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Somebody this morning, this is a challenge to you. This is a challenge to those that are desperate, that are hungry. You've been following God for for a while, but nothing has changed. And you have to ask yourself, so have I fully given over myself to God? Have I said, have I really said yes to him? Have I really said yes? Or am I withholding something from him? Because if I give him all of me, then he's going to. He's going to reveal those problematic areas in my life that's going to that as I give to him, he's going to begin to transform me and there's going to be growth. There's going to be change. There's going to be uh, ma ma maturity that's going to take place. And that's how I become complete in him. It starts out with worship in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the sickness and people are dying around when things are not going the way that I anticipate, though my modus operandi just naturally is to go get a drink, will I abstain from that and go to follow God, to go pray, to go get in my word, to worship? Though I may have lost a loved one and 
my heart is broken and I'm grieving. Will I will I choose to go? Will I choose to go follow friends and go run the streets and go try to find vices that will temporarily uh, uh, numb the pain? Or will I seek God? He said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. In the midst of this pandemic, we need to be asking, we need, we need to be seeking, and we need to be knocking. Because out of this, the trajectory of, of our lives as a worshiper, as we continue to worship in the midst of everything that we're going through, the trajectory of our lives, the trajectory of our children's lives, the trajectory of the generations that will come up after, after us will be transformed or changed because we have chosen to live a lifestyle of worship in spite of the chaos and the fear and the anxieties. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you. We honor you tonight or this morning. God, I magnify you, God, for the challenge. But I do realize that there are those out there that are struggling. Struggling in the mind, struggling in their bodies. And God, I'm praying right now for strength. I'm praying right now that you will provide the courage right now. Oh, God, hallelujah, that they can worship you by giving of themselves even when it hurts. Even when they don't understand of what's going on, I can surrender my life to you and let you do what you do best, which is take control. Hallelujah. On the job and in the schools and in our homes and our marriages. God, I'm asking you that we will have the faith and the trust to give it unto you. Hallelujah. I'm praying right now that you would touch every heart that is listening in on this morning. I pray that you would touch them right now. God, you know the need. And so I'm praying that you will rush in. Hallelujah. And touch them right now. Holy, completely right now in the name of Jesus. Somebody is on the brink of giving up. Somebody is hurrying right now. But I'm I'm praying that you will send the oil that will soothe the wound right now in the name of Jesus Christ. God, do what only you do. I'm, I'm praying that your presence will rush in right now and bring salvation to somebody who is locked down in the name of Jesus Christ. God, we need you, Jesus. We need your power and your strength and your joy and your peace right now. God, touch my sisters and my brothers right now in the name of Jesus. Somebody, God, needs a touch from you, God. So I'm praying that you will do what only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, well, family. So today's message is Here I Am. Pastor Ralph spoke about Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. Now, as a mother, that is huge. I mean, I love my kids. They wreck my nerves. But would I truly be ready to quickly get rid of them because of what I heard? I mean, in a situation like that, you got to know that you know that you know that you know you heard the voice of God, okay? But essentially, Abraham is saying, God, I hear you and I'm willing to do what you ask. Now, how many of you can do that? Are you ready and willing to be used by God at any given moment? Make this declaration with me today. Here I am, God. I will go where you need me to go and I will say what you want me to say. It may be uncomfortable, but here I am. It may hurt, but here I am. People may talk about me, but here I am. I may lose friends, but here I am. Were you able to grab a nugget from today's message? If so, feel free to share with somebody today. You never know who needs it. If you haven't done so already, it's not too late to share on Facebook and YouTube. And if you'd like to connect with us or even have questions about some of these messages you've been hearing, please text The Well to 66866 or email us at info at .com. Click on the giving tab of our website, thewellhow.com, to sow into our ministry. With your help, we will continue to grow and advance the way God has intended. You can also cash app us at Daryl Sign The Well How. We love you and we hope you enjoy today's message. I hope you can join us next week, same time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, same place, YouTube and Facebook next week. God bless.